come. I know it's early morning on a Saturday. I know that this new cyclone we are all living in is just keeping us completely, completely hectic. So that we that we have participants and we've got people here on a Saturday morning at nine o'clock. I really, really appreciate um, because I think it's it's extremely it's an extremely important topic and it's something that's very close to all of our hearts actually, especially as as Saneth. Um, so by way of a very brief introduction, I'm Katie. I'm the Gauteng convener for Saneth. And we have a very, very special guest with us today, psychologist Zamo Mbele. Um, I've, I've been lucky enough to interact with Zamo and to be exposed to his work through some of the work that we've done with Zamo um, and Newsroom Africa, especially at the height of COVID, when, when I thought that, that our reporters were taking particular strain, you know, having to work through COVID, with COVID sometimes, it was just hectic. It was a very difficult period for the country and for individuals, and Zamo's insights were invaluable. And reporter wellness and journalist wellness is something that we take very, very seriously, because we can joke about living in a news cyclone, as I love to call it. We can joke about the pressures and the stress and you know, running from one story and one set of breaking news to another. But the reality is that it can end up taking its toll and we end up with teams and as individuals and as leaders of our teams struggling. So hopefully today, Zama will give us some magnificent tools that will allow us to have a few coping mechanisms and strategies so that when we do feel it's a lot and too much, then we know um, that number one, we're not alone in this, we're all together. Uh, number two, that he's taught us these, these mechanisms. And number three, that SANEF as an organization is also here to help with these kinds of things. So yes, I know that SANEF has been on everyone's lips and minds this week, particularly with the SABC and what is SANEF doing and the meetings we've had, but this is something else equally important. And reporter and journalism and newsroom wellness is a huge priority for us. Zamo, over to you. Thank you for, for giving us of your time. We value your time and expertise. Um, Yes, and we look forward to, to this morning's session. Great. Thank you, Kate. And um, really thank you for, for, for that introduction. And as always, thank you for um, pulling all of this together, yourself and, and the team. Because as I always say, that I, I really think it's incredibly important and very necessary for us to be having these conversations and, and talks. So um, just very firstly, I'm going to be switching at a point, or maybe I'll kind of do a dual mechanism of also using my laptop as soon as that gets uh, going so that I can share with you um, my slides. Um, and of course, at, afterwards, I'm going to circulate them so that everybody can have them. You'll see what I've done in the slides is I've actually given quite a lot of information. Um, so it's, it's almost lecture style. So that's because I want you to be able to refer to it and reference it um, whenever you might need in, in the future. So I will share that with, with Katie and the team and um, they will distribute on my behalf. Welcome everybody. And again, to echo Katie's words, thank you for being here so early on a Saturday morning. Um, I think there could be a million different places that a, a whole host of people could have been. So I do think that this is an important place to be. So, so thank you for that. Um, myself and Katie have been working for a while uh, and the first time we met was at a, um, uh, I suppose it was a joint conversation that we're having with SADIG and we invited a few guests, most almost all of them being journalists. And in fact, I was just looking at um, who's on the call today and wondering if I recognize some people and or if we've worked, there may be one or two people. So hello to everybody. I think that uh, having conversations with journalism and media is incredibly important, uh, especially because most of the times we rely on journalism and media to be able to transmit the conversations that we want to have with the general population. So these are very unique opportunities, not just to speak through you, to speak to you um, and to speak with you, um, of course, as I say, because I think it's incredibly necessary. And it's something that I also think is um, 
it's a strange kind of magic. You see, I do a lot of teaching and training of uh, psychologists and young psychologists. And what I find is that there can be this real um, wish always to work with the person on the other side, which results in a neglect with working with yourself. Uh, so today we're not doing something that I think a lot of you are really good at and very familiar with, which is to speak to other people. Actually, there's a great deal of inversion and really kind of looking at ourselves um, and doing that conversation. I was again thinking a little bit about my uh, interest in working with the media and journalism, and some of it derives from the fact that I myself uh, have a, a real appreciation for what it is that you do. Um, and to some extent, some uh, training and knowledge. I have an undergraduate in, in media studies. I've always had an affinity to, to really try and look at that. So I wanted to really disclaim that at the very beginning. I want to um, shape our conversation this morning in the following way. So I'll give a presentation and talk uh, after which you will have access to it. I'll send it through to you and you can have it. As I said, it's quite dense. And at the best of times, there are a lot of stacks and, and so on and so forth. It's really just to punctuate points um, in, in many ways. So you, you know, we don't have to follow it specifically. I'm going to give a bit of an introduction in trying to context COVID and the times that we're in. I've been working quite a lot uh, during COVID to, with a team that uh, formed the um, response team to the mental health of frontline healthcare workers. And we've been collating a lot of information in the last eight months or so. So I'm gonna give a little bit of background there. I'm then gonna move into specifically how uh, COVID or rather, excuse me, specifically how um, trauma presents and is present in journalism and with journalists. So then I'll be speaking specifically to you. Uh, and I'm going to speak about PTSD in that regard. And then I'm going to move on to anxiety disorders. I'm not going to spend a lot of time there because I do want to move on to my third point, which is depression. And I want to give the very basic depression conversation for recognition of symptoms, to also maybe do something which I've done for this presentation quite uniquely, speak about high functioning depression. I'm currently trying to look at the presence of high functioning depression in professionals such as yourselves, which is much more prevalent than an ordinary depression. I'm gonna to touch very briefly on burnout because I think that um, that's where we are, most of us. And um, there's a more extensive conversation around burnout, which I won't be able to get into. So hopefully this will give you a really good introduction. And then I'm going to um, give you hopefully some, some coping strategies and tools that you might be able to, to use um, in working yourselves with some burnout, um, some depression, and anxiety. So that will be the last part of my conversation. I have also prepared here, I was doing a lot of research specifically on um, newsrooms. And I would have loved to have just the conversation on newsrooms, though we won't be able to. So what I have prepared um, is also some recommendations and suggestions, actually, uh, for uh, those managers that might be with us on the call um, on what to do in your newsrooms to try and make it a bit of a healthier, happier space uh, as well. Cool. I also want to encourage you while I'm having, while I'm giving my presentation to send messages on the chat. If you want me to address something, uh, you can send it. I, I'm not certain if Zoom allows you to send it anonymously, though, of course, you know, you can, you can say to me uh, if you want it to just be anonymous and then I will, I will kind of read it out or address it in that regard. Or if you want it to be public, which would be great, then we can also all have access to it as well um, in, 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 in the conversation. And then at the end, I'll also leave some time for question and answer and discussion, which I really look forward to um, and, and really enjoy and really encourage us all to, to participate in, in that. All right. And as I always say in, in, in these conversations, if at any point you want to um, interrupt me, please feel free. Um, and I really encourage that because um, I can speak a lot 
though I'm more interested in having a conversation than anything else in, in doing. All right, and and if there's sorry, last point, if there's anything that you want me specifically to address, you can say it now, and you can say it um, as I am going both in terms of just unmuting and interrupting, I really do not mind, as well as saying something on um, the chat box. Cool. Thanks, Amo. I think I'm that's good. a great way of working. Um, we can either talk on the chat box or, I don't know, does Zoom have a raised hand function? I'm not sure. It does. It, actually, it, it does have a raised hand function and you could absolutely do that, yeah. Um, cool. Katie, are you monitoring the, waiting room because because i'm going to ask you soon just to let me in again from a different um, i'm now. not that's happening uh, from as I'm oh, jonathan. Jonathan. Yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah okay great thank you jonathan in a second i'll, I'll join with my laptop and then you will just uh, 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 let me in what there. i will do zamo i will monitor if you like the um the questions and any raised hands and maybe just give you a heads up if there's something that someone wants you to address great great thank you my interest in, in working with journalism has really led me to do a lot of uh, uh, research around the susceptibility. And I have some bad news. And some of the bad news is that journalists and people working in media are considered some of the high risk, more vulnerable populations, actually. And this is for two reasons uh, that I want to introduce. So let me pause and also say, what we know is that by being informed of some of the things to look out for, um, and by giving some coping strategies, those two things really do help us to be better because it allows you to know what to look out for if something is wrong. And then, as I said in the end of my presentation, it allows you to know what to do. So I'm saying this because you'll hear a lot of my presentation is really geared towards um, giving you information around pathology or symptoms or syndromes or what to look out for. So to go back to my point, we know that people working in journalism and media are highly susceptible to um, psychological distress and in some regards, psychiatric uh, distress as well. And this is for two reasons. Number one, and again, you're not gonna like me saying this, I'll say it anyway, is that people drawn towards uh, information sharing, oftentimes towards trauma, like uh, journalism, media, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, uh, emergency services, so on and so forth, have also been known to have some of that inside of themselves uh, as well. So you might not know this, and there may be a strange, um, this might sound very strange, that actually oftentimes there's a predisposition, both of a curiosity, but also of trying to work through something yourself that draws you to this. And that's the first susceptibility. The second one, which becomes apparent is that obviously you get exposed again and again to um, difficulties and really strange um, difficult situations that I think a lot of you will be familiar with, which really do uh, perpetuate and or uh, enforce a lot of, or reinforce a lot of uh, trauma and, and other distresses. Okay, there we go, Jonathan, if you do. Some of you need Jonathan's assistance. Yes, Jonathan, if you can allow me to share screen on the other device. Uh, Zama, you, you should be able to. Um, it's everything is, should be allowed. Um, I'm just having a look here. You winning that shot? Um, um, so give me one second. I am winning. Give me one second. You'll just confirm that you can see my screen. 
Yes, it's it's showing up. And then you confirm in a second that you can see the presentation overall. Yes, it's right. Perfect. So anyway, I mean, part of what I wanted to say in that regard is to say that this, this predisposition exists before COVID. What COVID has is additional pressure on you and on everybody else and a unique type of pressure, uh, actually, which is really terrible. What I like to uh, speak about are the phases of COVID that um, um, we've kind of uh, been able to glean from a lot of research that has been done internationally. And it's a little bit superficial and it's not that uh, um, discreet, though I think it's quite helpful to imagine that there are different phases of COVID that we, are, we have been through and that we're going through and that different populations also go through, which I think allow us to know where we're at and um, what it is that we need to be doing at this particular time. Now, of course, again, this is just an attempt to try and neaten something which is incredibly messy. It is not neat. It makes no sense, uh, which is one of the difficulties around this, this COVID difficulty. So if I present this, what I, and this is a model that we've been working on. This is actually a model that helped us design a lot of our um, um, healthcare worker, frontline healthcare worker responses. And this is a model that in fact, a lot of governments have also been using to try and um, help uh, design just even uh, medical responses. I'm gonna speak specifically to, to um, tail off and post COVID phase though. Briefly, you will remember preparation phase was at the very beginning of this year, around uh, uh, April when uh, we had the first lockdown and it was three weeks and we all thought it was going to be three weeks and we can all laugh at ourselves now in hindsight and we we're all looking forward to that and um, tent hosp and field hospitals were being set up and so on and so forth. In that phase, what we wanted to do is really just to know that we are preparing. However, the psychological effect of that phase is that we had a great deal of anticipatory anxiety. And if we had been meeting and speaking at that time, I would have spoken to you quite a lot, preparation and early phase, around what anticipatory anxiety is and what it does. And really what it is, it's the anticipation that something bad is coming, which fills you with adrenaline and um, prepares you for something. So there's a great deal of hypervigilance, right? And really the infusion of adrenaline can be something that is incredibly helpful. It's almost like you're getting ready for battle, however, it's exhausting. Adrenaline is almost like a nitrogen or something like that. It's, it, it pumps into your body and it raises you for something and you get, you get a great deal of high speed. However, it's a burst because it's not sustainable. And um, what it results in afterwards is a great deal of exhaustion once it leaves your body because it's activated a whole lot. Now imagine that for your own psychology, that your body and your mind for a period of a few weeks was hypervigilant and very ready. And this is one of the reasons once you get into mid and peak, you get a great deal of exhaustion and a collapse because you've been hyper prepared um, because of an anticipation of something coming and then you're going to crash. This is not even considering also the fact that mid and peak phase came with them a whole lot of fatigue, um, which was a result, and I'll address this a little bit later, of people working a lot more and working very differently, which requires another uh, a degree of attention and attentiveness in, in, in a huge way. Anyway, so we all know we're exhausted and, I, and I'm saying that it's part because we've come from a preparation phase and an early phase, which had a high degree of uh, adrenaline and anticipatory anxiety. We also worked a lot and in a very different way, which requires more attention and energy during mid and peak phase. And by the point you get to tail off and post COVID phase, which we're not in post COVID phase, you have high levels of burnout in tail off phase, which is partly where we are arguably, so what we know is that in the post-COVID phase, we have degrees of post-traumatic disorders, high degrees of anxieties, as well as depressions. So where we are now, which is post, which is tail off phase, what we're expecting, and I hope that it speaks to some of you, and of course I hope not, are the high degrees of burnout that you will be experiencing and that a lot of your colleagues will be experiencing. So if I pitch this conversation to managers 
I want to inform them to look out for the burnout and how to um, um, address it. And if I pitch it to healthcare workers and the, the managers there, I want to help them address how to allocate resources in the Taylor phase and in the post-COVID phase in order not just to address the burnout, though to limit the amount of um, post-traumatic stress and depression that follows uh, in those phases. So as I said, I mean, this is just kind of um, um, some of the conversations that we have of what to anticipate. For example, in the Taylor phase, um, uh, staff running out on burnout and potential retrospective guilt. Um, and when we're speaking about post-COVID phase, there you see the delayed stress response. And, and what we mean by that, which is really scary, is that a lot of people are speaking about the, the second pandemic, which is a mental health pandemic, is that actually the results of the pandemic are not even being seen or felt now. It's going to be, I was saying in about July and June, it's going to be 18 months from now. So in a year's time, we'll be experiencing and expecting the real psychological um, results of, of this to, to be showing. And we need to prepare for that because the more we do, actually the more we can um, prevent it and mitigate against it in, in a huge way. And I think a lot of you, I mean, I will speak a little bit later around the, the conversations that we've been having that a lot of the journalists and journalism that has been happening have been forced to do health journalism, whereas before they haven't been prepared. So another conversation that we need to have is how to report and how to capacitate yourself to be um, a health journalist in this time. Not just a health journalist in terms of reporting on the health and as in the physiology of COVID, though mental health as well. I mean, some colleagues that are on this call and that I've worked with in, in, in uh, media and journalism are very are experts in health journalism. Though a lot of people have been forced to, to work there. So what we do know, of course, is that if we do this preparation now, not only will you as colleagues be capacitated and equipped to report on um, psychological uh, uh, distress and well-being, but also you will generally be better off. I love to speak about the five stages of grief because I think that it really captures what a lot of us have been experiencing during this pandemic and during lockdown and will continue to, to experience. So Kubler-Ross, who was a um, so psychiatrist, came up with this idea that um, when something drastic happens and oftentimes a disaster, we go through five stages of grief. Um, and it's not linear and you do not necessarily have to go through all of them and uh, you can go back and forth in different ways. So I thought it was really helpful to just put into words what it is that I have been going through, what a lot of colleagues and people that uh, and family have been going through and, and maybe even for you. And these five stages of grief include denial, anger, bargaining, depression and acceptance. And the idea is that when something terrible happens, oftentimes there's a denial of it. Now this is as far as a loss of somebody or something, as well as something that we find ourselves in at this point, which is a pandemic. And you might remember, for example, the denial that South Africans had that, you know, um, we're gonna be immune to this because of uh, the different vaccinations that we've had as children, or it doesn't affect people in, it doesn't seem to be affecting people in Africa so much and so on and so forth. And then we started to see a great deal of anger. And this anger was shown uh, for example, in the way that a lot of us were responding to lockdown and how infuriating it made us um, in many ways. And the, and the bargaining, I would interpret, came around the idea that, okay, the peak is not going to be that bad. It should be over by July and August and so on and so forth. And we hit depressions all the time. And the depressions are not even related to the bereavement and losses, though the ordinary sadness and the ordinary uh, moroseness that a lot of people have been reporting and is currently being um, researched around the fact that our lives have changed and a lot is, has happened to us that we never um, um, expected. So the good news is the ability to actually go through all of that stage, those stages does allow us to get to some degree of acceptance. And acceptance is not as happy as I suppose that particular faces. It's, it's quite sobering. Um, the what it does is it allows you to go through the situation without all of the energy, for example, that comes with anger and bargaining, and also not as much the depression that um, precedes it. 
Acceptance is an ability to know what it is that you can do and what it is that you cannot. And I say uh, uh, also when I speak about this is that, remember one can go through all of these five stages in one day, in one morning, um, in many ways. I wanted then to, to shift specifically and focus on journalism. And I I've been looking at a lot of research and it's, it's incredible. And I won't bore you with all of it. Though this I found really incredible. There was a, a research being done in um, North America. I'm going to refer to about four or five research studies in, in this talk. And one of them found that 60% of journalists surveyed so far during the pandemic said that they are working harder during the pandemic at the same time that um, uh, they've increased responsibilities at home. And I think that that is an underappreciated um, uh, confounding variable is that a lot of people are having to do two jobs now, which is your job that you are used to. And the second one is the job that you oftentimes outsource um, to teachers, to caregivers, minders, so on and so forth. So if there's not a recognition, the fact that you are working twice as hard, there's also then not a response. Of course, at this point, you can begin to see how and why it is that a lot of people are burnt out and, and exhausted. What was also very fascinating when I was looking at newsrooms was that uh, um, said journalists in this study, uh, when they were interviewed, said so far, given their news organizations, they gave them a six out of 10 when it came to how to be supportive um, during the, the pandemic, which is actually a great score I work a lot with uh, corporates and commercials, and oftentimes that score is about four to two out of 10. So I think that there's something really encouraging in being able to say that a lot of newsrooms have recognized the, the, the importance of being supportive. And this is one of the positive spin-offs that we have seen during this time, is that a lot of um, organizations, managers have recognized the importance of mental health and have done something to respond to it. I also wanted to say a little bit, um, uh, taking a bit of advantage at this point, is that I think initiatives like this, that SANF organizes, are part of what kicks that score up to six out of 10 or potentially eight out of 10. Um, the, the getting everybody together, even if it's a Saturday morning, to try and um, respond to something. Reuters has a great uh, um, uh, research that they're doing at this moment, and they did it in June this year. And um, they surveyed 73 journalists from international media organizations, including South Africa. I'm not certain if some of you were, were part of that. So the next two slides will, will reflect on that. And I thought it was really nice uh, um, as introduction. They found that amongst the survey, 63 um, respondents, excuse me, anyway, um, and 4% were health journalists. The importance of that stat is that a lot of people are being asked to do something which is outside their um, speciality skill set. And that means that there's a lot of catching up of uh, knowledge and uh, what it is that they, they are reporting, which is a lot more work and upskilling themselves. I thought that was very interesting. What else they found, I've just picked up five interesting points. Here. What else they found is that 70% um, of respondents said they suffered from some form of psychological response which is a huge number, seven out of 10 people. And about a quarter of the responders, 25%, said they experienced clinically significant symptoms of anxiety, including worry, insomnia, poor concentration, and feeling on the edge. I'm going to refer just now to what, what those symptoms tell us so that you can know uh, in, in a second. 11% of journalists covering COVID COVID-19 who participated in the survey reported symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, and this is one of the reasons I'm going to cover it. Symptoms include uh, intrusive thoughts, recurring thoughts, memories of, tra of, of a traumatic COVID-19 related events, and a desire to avoid uh, recollections of the event and feeling guilty, um, fear, anger, horror, and shame. The feeling guilty is something that I oftentimes speak about in relation to a concept called moral injury. Now, moral injury is something that a lot of doctors um, and frontline healthcare workers will be familiar with, though I do think that it's very relevant to, to speak about it in this forum. And moral injury is oftentimes being put in a situation where you are being asked to act and or make decisions which contradict your moral compass and or your ethical professional practice. 
So moral injury for doctors oftentimes looks like um, being prioritizing who to treat and who not to, and then experiencing that great deg degree of guilt um, um, resulting from the people that you, you do not treat. I think the, the moral injury in media and journalism is a prioritization of certain stories over others, um, of certain people and human beings and so on and so forth more than, uh, more than others, which can be incredibly painful actually. And oftentimes we see the results of moral injury only really coming about, um, again, about six to 18 months after the actual um, um, uh, event. I thought that that was also really interesting. 60% of respondents um, reported working longer hours since the, um, um, the excuse me, 60% responded working longer hours since the pandemic started. This burden fell disproportionately on women who felt incredibly incredible pressure to do more at home and to work with fewer resources. And some of you who may have heard me speak before know that I really do punctuate this point because I think it's important to um, uh, say that the, anyway, you know, let me not get into it though, the, the mothers oftentimes feel or feeling a lot of the difficulties because of having to do more than one job. I wanted to, to put this out there, and this is maybe another reason I love working with media and journalism is that uh, I think we do a lot of the same job actually as a psychotherapist and, and um, the work that you do. So we know that during a natural disaster or an outbreak of violence, uh, a journalist and a psychotherapist oftentimes take on the role of the witness. Witnessing is so powerful. However, it can also be so um, uh, potent and, and so dangerous. Covering a trauma can generate another kind of trauma, like a therapist who through the process of transference, and I'll explain that in a second, can vicariously experience the patient's emotional pain, reporters may also experience that type of indirect secondary trauma through victims they interview and um, the graphic scenes to which they must bear witness to. It's, it's such a pity that as far as I know, and I do not know enough, there isn't enough training for a media and journalism to appreciate two things. Number one is how much you can get impacted by your work and how it happens. And that's the reference to transference. And that is actually when you are witnessing something, one of the reasons that's so powerful to the person you're witnessing it to is that actually they share the burden. And it might sound a little bit mystical and magical, but actually what they do do is confer unto you a little bit of their pain. And that's why um, um, to share something difficult can feel so helpful. Now, the second thing that I think is a pity is that as a psychotherapist, part of our training prepares us and teaches us how to manage that. And I think it's a pity that in um, media journalism, there isn't enough of that, not just to recognize and to know that that's going to happen, but also how to manage that and how not to um, take on so much of it. Oftentimes this results in PTSD and I'm gonna rifle through it um, because I'm gonna give you the slides. I just wanted to say a few things. Um, in that said, you know, in a different study actually from the United States, they were looking at um, journalists who covered Hurricane Harvey. And according to that survey, one in five respondents met the threshold for PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. And 90% experienced some levels of PTSD symptoms related to, to the coverage of that hurricane. I think the most important point there is 90% experienced some level of post-traumatic stress. PTSD is a severe psychopathology and, um, you know, it's, it's when things have really gone bad. Though we have other things before that, including acute stress response, which a lot of people go through, though do not really recognize or know that, especially in South Africa, you know, kind of that high degree of anxiety when you leave your home or um, that kind of hypervigilance now that you, we, we're all experiencing it if you go to a restaurant. That is an acute stress response and that shouldn't be happening. And I think it's important to note it as that, be, to highlight how much stress actually and trauma we're going through, but also to call attention actually to the fact that a lot of us are sitting with symptoms that we do not know should not be there. 
in, in, in many ways. Um, I also thought that it was really helpful to put this quote in, um, which is with most breaking news situations, we're talking about people just being curious about what's going on. But when you're talking about something like a region wide disaster, you're talking about people's actual lives. The news can potentially save someone's life. And this is one of the dilemmas that um, a lot of media and journalism face is that it, there is, um, it's really horrible to be reporting and presenting a lot of this news, though it's actually incredibly important um, in, in saving lives. I mean, I don't have to say this in, in this forum. I won't speak about this very much, though there was a very interesting study that um, was looking at user-generated content. And this is like cell phone videos and uh, photos uh, obtained from uh, members of the public and so on and so forth. And what it found is that um, individuals who have, the, excuse me, the frequency of exposure to UGC, user generated content, um, independently predicted higher scores of mental health uh, screenings for PTSD, depression, and psychological distress. And I think that that's actually very interesting just for, for two reasons. One of them is that you might not be aware that actually uh, consuming, producing, and publishing the information that you do is in itself uh, a traumatic experience and can lead to trauma. However, there is some good news. And in this regard, I'm speaking to some of the managers in the room, is that the authors concluded that the frequency of exposure to this content rather than the duration so how, how frequent it was rather than how long is linked to more symptoms of emotional distress. So in other words, the number of shifts that journalists spent looking at uh, this content mattered more than the length of the shift in terms of emotional impact. And this is also important for a reassuring point to a lot of people who work very many hours um, in, in thing. And a little bit later, I will elaborate on some of the suggestions. The one of them is that they suggested that news organizations might reduce the frequency of journalists' exposure to this content to minimize the risk of emotional harm. And the reduction of frequency also includes, and I'll speak about this later, um, doing a lot more variety and diversity in what it is that you're covering. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on anxiety because I'm, I'm much more interested in, in um, high functioning depression for today's conversation. Though I think that, um, instead of a definition, I want to speak about something that uh, um, um, a lot of people, a lot of professionals experience, which is a generalized anxiety. Generalized anxiety is the most diagnosed form of anxiety. I think the current uh, um, stat prevalence for, for anxiety is about seven out of 10 individuals. And a lot of us experience anxiety and think it's very ordinary and very normal um, in our lives as in a generalized anxiety and actually do not know that there's something wrong. It involves a consistent um, a feeling of anxiety regarding anything. And people who with GAD struggle to control their worries. Of course, we know that worry and anxiety is incredibly helpful. So um, a good degree of anxiety we know can improve a whole host of functions actually. It improves alertness, um, it readies you, it improves sharpness, so on and so forth. It, it, it tells you that something important is going on. But once you have a generalized anxiety, that alertness, sharpness, and so on and so forth is there all the time. It's your um, resting level uh, in, in, in many ways, which actually is not resting. And of course, we know the health um, difficulties that come with it and so on and so forth. So I wanted to go through some six symptoms, the six major symptoms of it, so that you might be able to know and recognize in yourself and others uh, if there is a generalized anxiety. These include restlessness, always feeling on the edge, being easily fatigued, and it fatigues you. Being anxious is an incredibly exhausting thing. Difficulty concentrating or mind going blank, irritability, muscle tension and sleep disturbance. And we have three different types of sleep disturbance, disturbances. We have um, what we call um, initial insomnia where um, it's difficult falling asleep. And that's because the thoughts and uh, preoccupation are running from the day. You also have interrupted or interfered insomnia where um, you can actually fall asleep quite quickly because you're quite tired from the anxiety of the day. So you actually crash. However, 
as as you do not ever get into REM sleep, which is um, random eye movement sleep. And as soon as there's a stimulant from outside, a dog barking or something, you wake up very quickly. And sometimes there's the, 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 the stimulus is very, very subtle. But because you're on edge, you actually cannot maintain the sleep and you actually cannot get into a restful sleep, which is a different conversation. I know I said I wasn't gonna spend time on anxiety, but you know how, you can see how excited I get about these things. Though, which is a different conversation because you actually need REM sleep, REM sleep, which is a very deep sleep in order to rest. You get a lot of people who might be able to get 10 hours of sleep to still feel exhausted because you're not getting REM sleep, which is a deep sleep. Um, though your anxiety, because there's cortisol and there's uh, uh, adrenaline, does not allow you actually to fall into REM sleep. So you wake up very quickly and, and it's a disruptive sleep. And then you get um, 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 terminal insomnia where um, you wake up at three and you just do not fall asleep for, for the rest of the time. Anyway, I thought that it, it was, and I've stolen the slide from a different talk that the, the, hopefully to try and help you understand what's going on is that imagine this pandemic where nobody knows what's going on put into humans or onto humans who love certainty. You know, we are hardwired to want to know what's happening uh, um, with ourselves and in the world and to have a degree of control. And um, when we notice that things are feeling threatening to us, we, we really get terrified. When things feel uncertain or when we don't generally feel safe, it's normal to feel stressed. This very action while is there to protect us can cause us all sorts of havoc when there's a sense of uncertainty and conflicting information around us. And I think that this quote really captures um, a great deal of why we're feeling all sorts of stress, uh, both in terms of our higher degrees of anxiety and our higher degrees of um, um, depression. I also, uh, speak a little bit around the fact that there is something about COVID-19 which actually mimics and um, it, um, it, it's, it, it creates a chameleon infect for, for anxiety because it, it thrusts upon us um, not knowing, not being certain, not being in control. And um, you can imagine, you know, the cocktail of the following ingredients. There's an uncertainty about the future. There's a lack of control. There are really healthy paranoid thoughts around Am I going to get ill? Is my family going to get ill? There's no safety and security. Structure and routine have been thrown out the window. And there's a constant uh, a new information flow. You can see how this really contrib contributes to anxiety. And this is also partly almost to some extent to give you permission to be kind to yourself and others that we're in a situation that doesn't use anxiety. Um, a little bit on depression again to kind of recognize some of the symptoms. And I, um, in one of the studies, we found that two in five respondents meet the threshold for depression. Now, this is a major depression, and 93% of survey journalists experience some symptoms of depression. That's incredibly high, and um, it's a neglected population, and what a pity uh, in that regard. I'm not going to go into necessarily the, or maybe I should, the importance. I give a, a medical definition of um, depression so that you can know two things. One of them, it's a medical condition, you know. Um, that's how serious it is. It's not, it's not, some, it's not a personality thing, it's not a personal thing, it's a medical condition. Um, and the second reason that I wanted to give it is that, you know, some of us, we all feel low sometimes and occasionally, though the distinction is that there's certain um, things that we look for as clinicians. One of them is duration two week period in which a person is persistently feeling depressed or becomes unable to experience pleasure. And that second criteria is very important. The thing about depression is not what it kind of brings with it, which is a lowness and a sorrow. It also what it takes with it, which is the ability to feel pleasure. And a lot of people miss that uh, in trying to understand what's going on with them is once you stop feeling good about things that you used to feel good about, um, it's a real symptom. And, and that's one of the devastations also uh, about a depression. It comes with a whole host of um, um, symptoms, which you know are available to you there. And um, I, th I think are, are, are quite recognizable. Though that's mostly for me, right? As a clinician, I look for these symptoms. 
I think um, mostly as individuals, this is what it feels like to be depressed. Um, Self-criticism, feeling inferior, worthlessness, guilt, sense of having failed, loss of approval, loss of love, depreciating self-esteem, fear, isolated, weak, helpless, inadequate, abandoned, um, unloved, angry, frustrated, indecisive, suicidal, uh, unattractive, fatigue, restless, constipation, which is a physical and very important thing to look for, unworthy and confused. Um, yeah. And again, I, I spoke a little bit around how COVID can mimic anxiety. COVID can also mimic and create uh, depression because of the fact that a lot of our pleasurable activities have been restricted. Weight changes, COVID weight gain is a real thing. Routine is out the, the window and monotony creates fatigue, by the way. Um, and I won't be able to get into it today. Uh, and a high degree of helplessness and hopelessness, which is a cornerstone of, um, of a depression and the bad news syndrome. And if there was anybody who was ever at the front line of the bad news syndrome, it is you. Because we know that by the, the, the bad news reported and published is um, a fraction of the bad news um, um, experienced, seen and investigated by journalism and, and policemen actually in a strange way. What I'm excited about, and this is my, my 2020 topic that I'm developing is high functioning depression, because it's a strange type of depression. It usually does not get diagnosed. It's very difficult to see and, and diagnose. And um, <clears throat> that's because it actually does not present itself typically. A, it, it doesn't have the extremity of, of, of symptoms. So people with high level depression do not oftentimes have the suicidal ideation. They may wish they want to die, though they do not think and wish to kill themselves, which is, a, is an important distinction, you know? Um, and it, it doesn't have the high degree of typical symptoms such as tearfulness um, and, and so on and so forth. And actually, B, the reason high functioning depression is so difficult to diagnose is that because the individual is high functioning, they look functional and they oftentimes are. Though it's so much work to function, it takes everything out of you to function. People with high functioning depression will tell you how exhausted they are for two reasons. Number one, they're working very hard because they're high functioning. They, they're on a talk at, at 9, 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning, tongue in cheek. Though also, um, the second uh, reason is because it's so much work. It takes so much energy to do the same amount of work. And you're also working incredibly hard to convince yourself you're fine and to keep going. For example, um, these are kind of the, the, the five characters and symptoms of it. You don't feel like you're being true to how you really feel. And there's a strange incongruence inside of yourself because, well, you shouldn't be depressed and actually maybe you're not tearful and so on and so forth, though you know something is not okay inside, though it's very difficult to know what it is. You don't quite fit the criteria for um, depression that is usually put up, though actually something is also not quite okay. Good days are okay. And, and that's kind of when you can convince yourself and other people can be uh, convinced that actually they're fine. However, the bad days are terrible. They really are terrible. Happy times do not really chase away the sadness. They kind of work a little bit though. Soon enough, you slip back into, into sadness. Um, and, um, you oftentimes struggle to focus at work, which makes work more difficult. And what we know though, is that a lot of people with high functioning depression have had a depressive um, episode at, at some point. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for the questions. I will address them um, um, as, as we're going. Cool. And then guess which professional population is I think in the top five most, uh, most um, susceptible to burnout, it's journalism and journalists and people working in media. So I again want to draw a parallel between the work that you do and the work that I do by, by saying also that the, oh, oh, something happened. Sorry. So to know why that's happening. Some of there are some comments and some questions in the chat. Um, let, me, let me address those quickly, actually, while I get this presentation back. So how much REM sleep is recommended? 
So um, there's, I think it's about, it's uh, between four to six hours. So when there's a recommendation of um, seven to eight hours of sleep, it's, it's knowing that you're not going to get um, seven to eight hours of REM. So four to six hours um, is what is, is recommended of REM sleep. Uh, rapid eye movement sleep and that's as I said a deep sleep in fact what this is one of the reasons why people speak about um, a power nap what we know is that power naps have more capacity more likelihood to access REM than um, sleeping because you really do crash and you crash deep uh, in, in a huge way and that and actually uh, some um, research has shown that workplaces that have um, sleep labs, I think some of you will be familiar with that, um, have more productivity because people do get that REM. I think at a different point, I spoke about some, some other very interesting research I was, I was looking through recently, which says that, um, you know, in, in a kind of a, when you get that additional push of energy at like 12 o'clock to one o'clock in the morning when you're working late and all of a sudden you feel energized even though you're tired, that energy actually is there to help you sleep. It's a rejuvenation energy that actually is supposed to, um, in your sleep, give you the energy and the rest for, for tomorrow. And that's what you're getting also in, in REM sleep. It's very important. And your sleep specialists will tell you the, the, the devastations that, that can happen if you um, do not get enough REM sleep. Um, how do you time out? I'm going to definitely address that um, in, 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 in a second. If this kind of gets back again. Um, how to get, how to, to time out from um, the work that you do. It's in part of my recommendations. Give me one second. Let me try and sort this out. I don't know why. Can you still see my screen? No, we, no, we can't. Sure. Um, uh, sorry, Jonathan, can I ask for your help uh, um, again, just to stop me from sharing screen and then I'm gonna start again. Yeah, um, just click on the stop sharing button um, and then try and share again. Okay, give me one second. Shows a um, uh, just the black screen, so I think it is trying to share. Thank you to everybody for writing your comments and for um, yeah for all the questions and the comments in the inbox. I think they're really great. And when Zama sorts out the the tech side of it, we'll get we'll get to that. Okay, so I've just had a, a message from Zamo saying that he appears to have been kicked out of the session somehow or something's happened. Um, so he'll hopefully be back with us very soon. I see we've got a lot of new participants. So um, people who've joined us along the way, I just wanted to say that is fantastic. I'm so thrilled to those who've joined us along the way. This is, um, this is a really, really important workshop and a really important initiative. Um, we're doing it as part of our, our, our Senef Gauteng workshop, but in fact, it's so critical that we're hoping to, to spread it out to other provinces and to other regions as well. Um, we, are, we are definitely recording and we will share that recording. Zikona, I see your message on the chat group. So we'll definitely share this recording and we'll share it with our council members who will then pass on as well. Um, 
So that's really great. Any other questions or comments so far? I know Zamo's not with us. Maybe perhaps, Katie, people, if they've got ideas on how else we can just make sure that we reach out to other journalists, because I find that as journalists, we are the first to talk about other people's challenges, but are not willing to accept that we also do need help. And it's always encouraging if we are able to at least spread the word amongst our colleagues to say, you know, we are also human. Uh, yes, we live journalism. And that also, as Zamo was saying, puts us even more at risk, you know, but we need to be able to just share the message and get all journalists to understand that we also need help. Yeah, Maklati, I think you're absolutely right. And I think our call should be to editors to do this in newsrooms, but also to individual journalists to say, especially from what Zama was saying, let's not be afraid to reach out, to reach out and either ask for assistance or, or, or look at some of the, I'm sure we all recognize some of ourselves in these slides. I know that I do. You know, I look at this and I go, wow, Zamo, this is absolutely spot on. Yeah, and it's, and it's- um, Ah, you're back, hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm back. Yeah, sorry about that. It's actually for, for encouragement because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the tricky thing is that, you know, if all of us are going through this, then, then why should there be a stigma, so, on, so to speak? And, and what we're going through is very difficult. So, you know, I, we, we kind of, I was speaking about this before the pandemic because I, in terms of journalism and media, because it's there before the pandemic. Imagine now during the, pa the pandemic, I wanted to share something else, which is um, another another um, small piece of research that they're doing, is that one of the, the anxieties that a lot of especially mothers with um, children, though also just professionals have, is something like this, when, when your computer crashes. Um, because when you're in a room and you're in a meeting, there isn't this attendance to, oh my goodness, now I must log back in. And, which, which can bring a lot of stress because you, you feel under pressure. Um, and what they encourage you to do is to be okay with the fact that it's technology and especially in South Africa with load shedding and so on and so forth. And it's gonna go wrong um, um, in, in the future. So I was, I was trying to practice that a little bit for myself uh, when, when this crashed. Anyway, I'm going to carry on and, and, and rifle through school. I just wanted to, to again um, liken the work that we do and say that the relationships at frontliners, which include you, develop with their stories, include the relationships with the people and their families. And I don't know how many of you are aware of this, and that this is one of the reasons you get so bothered and so burdened um, with the work that you do, because you're working with people and their families. And this requires ongoing intense levels of personal emotional contact. Although such relationships can be rewarding, and that's one of the reasons you do what you do and engage in, they can also be quite stressful, particularly the frontliners setting where um, prevailing norms are to be selfless and to work long hours and to go the extra mile. Going the extra mile, of course, and all of that is what leads to burnout. And I'm not going to go into burnout too much, though. Um, a lot of people speak about burnout, though it's very difficult to explain what it is. It's an overwhelming exhaustion that you cannot recover from. It's feeling cynical and detached, and it's a sense of ineffectiveness and a lack of accomplishment. Um, it's, it's really quite serious, as you can see, once we, once we break it down in, into those three. And as I said, you'll have a copy of this presentation just so that there's a better understanding of the different domains of um, burnout, um, how it's depleting, it's, a, it's an unresolvable fatigue, um, and a loss of energy and an inability to get it back. And the cynicism is also very difficult to be around, actually. It's quite hard to be the burnt out person, but it's also quite hard to be around people who have been burnt out, who are burnt out. And the worst part is that it becomes in a cycle because it creates inefficiency and ineffectiveness, which reduces productivity, so on and so forth. Um, and I hope you can see then there that it, it's a, it, it can be a very dangerous thing, um, including for a newsroom and a working environment. Um, I won't go into the seven domains of it, though um, I thought it was very interesting when I looked at this research that between workload, being able to control what it is that you're doing, not experiencing enough reward, not being communal, 
the experience of fairness and unfairness, values of uh, values and job person and congruency are, are known as um, that. The consequences of it are um, uh, uh, detailed here. Um, I also include the kind of physiological consequences of it. So burnout is not just horrible for your internal self. Actually, it is um, um, it can have medical consequences too. Now, I actually want to stay here. So I've given you all of the bad news. I've um, told you what it is to look out for in yourself, why it happens to some extent. Um, and hopefully now I'm gonna spend um, maybe about five to 10 minutes trying to equip you with, with what it is to do. So what we know is that um, there are three places to respond to when it comes to journalism and media and working with stories. And remember, not all stories are apparently traumatic, right? The trauma occasionally comes in when I was referring to a little bit earlier, working with people's lives, for example, knowing the impact of something or what it is that you bump into when you're working with people. So this, I think, should be applied not just to the idea of working with traumatic stories, but with all stories. Um, and this is what we call prophylactic preparation. Prophylactic is treating something before it arrives. So that actually, it's almost like a vaccination. So that to the extent that you get exposed to, to that, what is difficult, actually you, you are ready. By the way, this conversation is prophylactic. So the reason for that is that it, um, it prepares you and it insulates you and it gives you um, um, more awareness so that things are less impactful for the future. So really what we recommend are um, kind of preparing and when you're in it and when you're recovering, and I'll reiterate this in, in a slide or two. So prepare for the story, set the frame, know um, when you're gonna begin and end and know your limits um, of where you can go in terms of which stories and um, where you can go emotionally and in details and also know your triggers. Um, there's a very interesting conversation that I have anyway about to, to feel fear is not bad because it gives you an indication um, of something. Now you can feel fear and still go and you'll be better prepared. And sometimes you can feel fear and know not to go to something. And that's in, in you know, I hope you can appreciate the metaphor of that. And know your, your weak points, you know, pay enough attention to yourself to listen on that before you go to, to do something. And when you're in it, kind of track your body's response to trauma, know it and acknowledge it. We know that naming is taming, actually. Um, know to yourself that you're feeling anxious, you're feeling um, saddened or you're feeling overwhelmed um, in something. Really naming something tames it and, and reduces the, the impact of it. Um, and rely on your defense mechanisms. A little bit earlier, um, I don't know what you're saying, Katie, though you're saying something about we must laugh. Oh, I cannot remember that we, we know we all laugh about it. And sometimes we must, you know, um, really sometimes we must because laughing is a defense and humor is a defense. So to know it just is important in two reasons. The first one is that you can use it and deploy it when you need to. But the second reason is that it can also give you information that you're feeling defensive and then it alerts you to the fact that something feels overwhelming. So really kind of become familiar with, with that and know which, which defenses work for you. Um, and also kind of track your body's response and, and um, your psychological response. Um, you know, if you're feeling something in your stomach, if you're um, feeling a headache, if you're feeling sweaty, if your mouth is dry, really know that this is, this is giving you information and acknowledge it. And then the after, after the fact, which is a body scan, checking where, you, where you're at. And um, one of the, the unintended good consequences of COVID is that it's kind of forced people to be a lot more attentive to themselves because we were all doing symptom checking. And as I said, naming is taming. So really knowing that something was, was hard and horrible can be very important. I was, I was, yes, please. We've got a question um, that I think deals with the previous slide that says, um, is it just me or are other people dealing with secondary trauma to the family? 
the constant grumpiness, not being able to protect them from hearing news broadcasts, even though we do try with earphones, etc. And they worry when we are a dangerous story when we get back late or if we're injured or narrowly escape harm. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think that, I mean, it's so complicated because uh, at a different time, what I, what I do speak about is the um, is secondary trauma. Um, as secondary trauma in this regard, I'm not certain exact, though, you know, it's secondary trauma in this regard, both in the sense that um, you can get traumatized by hearing something traumatic, um, right? And family can get traumatized by, that's then the third uh, degree trauma, tertiary, by hearing something uh, traumatic. However, there's also trauma of working from home that a lot of other people are experiencing where um, you are now being exposed to the frustrations and the distress of your partners, your, your, your you know, whoever's a work environment as well. And that's a different type of, of trauma. And grumpiness and irritability are all symptomatic, you know, um, of something going on. You know, even when you wake up in the morning and there's a morning grogginess, that's because your sleep has been disrupted. Your rest has been disrupted. And that grumpiness you can understand oftentimes um, when, when that happens. So grumpiness, if it's pervasive, if it's there during the day, the whole day, is an indication um, um, that something has happened. Um, just to return to the idea of danger stories, I mean, I think that it's, it's, it's hopefully one of the big take homes from today's conversation is that what a lot of people are not aware of is that you are working in a very traumatic environment and you're reporting on it, your, your daily, your bread and butter is about um, working with danger. And um, knowing that and being so aware of it is, is in itself uh, um, um, a trauma. And then I see, um, and also how do you deal with not being able to debrief with your family because it's too much for them and they're dealing with, with the trauma. I'll address that in, in, because I've got a few suggestions um, for that um in in many ways and oftentimes trauma um, families will tell you either when they're married to or they're living with psychologists doctors and journalists and policemen they don't want to hear it anymore because it's too much however it is important for you to be able to debrief and i've got a few suggestions in a second uh, i think a little bit earlier i was speaking about taking consistent breaks and the the consistent breaks are the following it's not just routine as in scheduling, knowing that they're going to be consistent breaks, but it's also deliberateness. It's much easier sometimes to keep going than to take the break. Um, though it's incredibly important to be deliberate about breaking it. it the, at a point, an understanding about, of burnout was that it is not stopping enough. It's not breaking enough. So we all have to work under pressure. And in fact, we're quite equipped to do that, most of us. However, the importance of taking the break is what stops the um, the kind of the continuity or the momentum which leads to burnout. Taking breaks is so important. Diversifying the types of stories that you do um, and newsrooms kind of really being deliberate and and this is very hard because as far as I understand it, we moved from a generalized journal journalism where people used to do everything, which did allow you to um, have a diversity to a lot more specialized journalism where people focus on things and that's what they do, which, which can really lead to um, burnout. So these are also some of the things that you can look out for and or do. Remember that you're not immune to the emotional impacts. Um, and maybe this is the fifth time I kind of say something like this today. You, you're not and you shouldn't. And if, if you are, something, something might be up. Um, so when, when there's, oh, sorry. So when there's a troubling stories while others may run away from it, the scenes, journalists have to rush towards it in order to um, stay resilient and effective. It's important to remember that stress can accumulate over periods of time. And that taking a break allows you to decant um, um, a, a lot of that stress. Know your signs in particular. I've spoken about signs and symptoms of depression, anxiety, um, and PTSD, which are very generic. So know your own. You know yourself quite well. And know what it is that exists inside of you that makes you vulnerable to um, struggling. And make note of all of these um, and make a plan to, to cope. Know your early signs too. 
early signs and symptoms can be very scary to pick up, but they're so helpful um, because they allow you to, to respond earlier. And I really like this idea of flattening your stress curve by taking downtime. So at this point, everybody has heard about the idea of flattening the curve of the COVID pandemic. However, there's also a similar curve, which is the, the amount of stress journalists um, experience. You need sleep and you need downtime. Create uh, self-care plans and be assertive about your boundaries. Um, at a time when we have so little control over what's going on in the world, small steps like this can really help overcome our business in, in a huge way. And this is my last slide, so we can have a bit of a discussion, is the role of newsrooms in advocating for mental health reports. Create protocols that once a quarter, um, we will have a, a, a wellness conversation. And it, it doesn't always have to be from psychology. It can also be from dietetics um, and, and, and mindfulness experts. Um, Katie organized a conversation with a breathing expert, um, which I thought was incredibly helpful and so on and so forth, you know. Such protocols are, are helpful, quarterly some things, you know. Um, appoint a, a committee who are going to be in charge not to neglect um, the, the mental health or of, of the organization. And they are going to um, get these people in to speak, make certain um, that things are fine and so on and so forth. Because on the one hand, it's everybody's job. And at the same time, if you have a committee who's dedicated to looking at it, then we know it's less likely to be neglected uh, in, in many ways. Give managers the skills to handle mental health in, in the newsroom, which is a lot of what we're doing today, recognizing and knowing uh, what is there and, and, and what, is, what is out there. Um, sorry, there was, there was a different point here, which is missed, which is to um, allow yourselves to have um, kind of debriefing sessions and they're very informal. They can be very informal where you as journalists know what's going on and why it's going on, which is very different to, to family members. And um, therefore you can feel much less anxious about sharing that because yes, family members hate hearing things again and again at the best of times. So um, if you commute and you speak, then that, that can be incredibly helpful. And occasionally it may be that you need to get somebody in to facilitate that, um, if necessary, then, then you can really do that. The um, lunch breaks, communal breaks, uh, before, during, and after are really helpful. I'll tell you this one very interesting study that came from um, Asia, specific to COVID and specific to uh, doctors and nurses, was that um, what they found really helpful was actually not getting a professional in to debrief and do that work. What they found helpful was to have um, um daily morning check-ins and um they can be 15 minutes to 50 minutes so really just saying where we at what's the plan for the day any residue from yesterday we need to address this is what we're doing um in in in, in the day and so on and so forth they found it really really helpful um and and then the other like tertiary matters there we're all scared we're all uncertain. Yesterday was hard. Sharing those things, normalizing them was one of the benefits that came from, from those meetings and, and check-ins. Um, Kaylin, if I read your question, because at this point I'm done with my slides, so I'm gonna jump right in. Um, Coming traumatic stories such as child killings, et cetera, and protests, how do you switch off? I think that part of knowing your, your limitations is also knowing that there are some um, stories or some incidences that may need you to pay more attention to in order to resolve. And that might mean taking more time than usual off and or the organization getting in um, somebody to help them kind of process it. Um, and organizations like, I suppose I can mention them, Section 27, for example, recognize that if something really has disrupted the, the organization Occasionally, they do get a facilitation and um, to process that and be able to move on. And what they found in that effectiveness, not Section 27, though, just general research, is that you um, manage the difficulty more and a productivity is maintained, actually. So it's an organization's best interest because it doesn't linger as much and impact people. Um, and also, of course, the most important one is that there's much less personal impact on a person. 
um, uh, recommendations for newsroom. Um, you have, I think I've, I've mentioned quite a few of them, and I'll send I'll send those as well. Those included um, convening and commuting. Uh, it included potentially having a, a, a committee that you can uh, work with where where necessary. Um, yeah. And uh, embroiled in the sadness, writing about them, finding difficult to feel myself in the process of internal. But yeah, I mean, I it's it's um, it is very normal. Uh, so the hardest thing, maybe, that I want to say, well, one of the hard things is that if you did not get embroiled, um, then you probably shouldn't be doing this, um, because I think part of what happens is your investment, not just in the job, though in the, in the people and in the story and in the vocation, means that you will get embroiled in, in a huge way. So I wouldn't necessarily want to take that away. Part of what I may want to address is how do you manage that getting embroiled? How do you get embroiled in a way that you can harness yourself, get embroiled, and then also kind of retreat um, and, 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 and manage with what it is that you know, including debriefings that I was referring to in a huge way and including taking breaks, diversifying, because remember, if you also get embroiled in really rewarding work, um, it can also be a treatment. It's also something that um, helps with, with the difficulties of getting embroiled with, with the, the hard and horrible work too. So the getting really involved is like in, doesn't seem as much of a, of a problem as it is the management and the, the of, of how to do that, how to um, not be uh, just impacted in a horrible way with what's going on. All right, I've spoken a lot and, and again, apologies for, for the disruptions and, and I'm so glad that we were able to um, attend to some questions as we're going. So I don't know if anybody, if there's an opportunity now to unmute and um, that we can have this conversation further with the time that we have left. Zama, thank you so much. Your slides were invaluable. Your thoughts were absolutely spot on. Um, I'd love to encourage those who want to say something, to comment, to contribute in any way, to ask a question, to please step forward now. I don't Maklatsi know. Is, Maklatsi's hand is raised. Ah, Maklatsi. Yes. Um, Zama, what I find is that for us, a lot of journalists, because we are driven by adrenaline, it doesn't hit us immediately. And sometimes it's much, it's years later that we start seeing that a story has really affected us. And I'll give you an example with myself. I covered uh, the earthquake in Haiti. And um, it was actually years later that I actually started dealing with the trauma that it actually induced. And one of the things that I, I was told is that sometimes it's not immediate because we deal with so much, but all of these things do catch up with us at some point. Absolutely, and I think, um, thank you for bringing that up, because it allows me to, to touch on uh, maybe two points. The first one is um, why it happens, and the second one is how it happens. Why it happens is that your psychology actually functions very similar to your physiology in the sense that when you're going through something dangerous and difficult, your physiology is more important in preparing and protecting, right? So this is one of the reasons why you can get hurt, though if you are in shock, you're not gonna feel the pain um, because adrenaline has kicked in, your um, parasympathetic systems are, are activated and you can keep going, you know? You, 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 you may know of um, different times where you may have been injured though you were able to keep going and then the pain comes later. Or uh, if you've had the misfortune of being in a, in a car accident, the swelling and the, um, the muscle pain comes the day after. Because in the moment actually, your, your body actually prepares you to and allows you to keep going. And just psychology works very similar. Um, in the moment, it, it, and it's a, it's, a, it's a protective function. It gives you all of the resources so that you can just keep doing it. And then it wears off. And once that wears off, it then takes stock 
of um, what has gone on and the impact of it. So when we're speaking, for example, about post-traumatic post disorder, that's only three to six months after the fact. In the, in the, in the interim, uh, there's acute stress responses, though actually oftentimes it doesn't seem like it's impacted you. It's only, as I say, three to six months after the fact. And that's why I say the second pandemic is only going to hit us third quarter, fourth quarter, 2021, and after that um, uh, in, 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 in many different ways. And, and this is why it's important to know and recognize that something that happened a few years ago can continue to impact you for years afterwards, as you're saying. Thank you for that. Zamo, I see a lot of, of, of comments here about how do I switch off? Um, so switching off is, is a topic in and of itself because you have very many ways of, of doing that. One of them is mindfulness. And I think that getting a mindfulness specialist is something else um, that, that might be helpful, uh, Katie and the team. Um, I think that not just in terms of kind of breathing mindfulness, but also how to remain mindful um, in moments and for periods. It's a small thing, though it's a huge uh, advancement that we've made in terms of psychological well-being. And that's a kind of ongoing uh, uh, switching off. Then there are more kind of intermediate switching offs, which include for um, taking the weekend or taking breaks that allow you not to do work. And of course, then there are the more longer term or macro switching offs, including um, um, leaves and um, vacations. There's a very interesting um, uh, phenomena that's, I think I've said this before, you will know that Investec, or you may know that Investec, for example, did away with leave days. And they say you can, you can take as much leave as possible. So that's because they know that people are less likely to take leave actually, and um, are going to take below average leave. So being, so it's, it's a bit, I mean, you know, I say this tongue, a bit tongue in cheek and they, they will come at me for this. So it's, um, it's actually relying on the fact that when people have an infinite amount of breaks to take, they are more likely to take under average, actually, versus when people are um, given leave to take. So the companies that close or institutions that close for uh, prescribed periods at prescribed times, and you are forced to take leave because it's very difficult, are the ones more likely to have employees who experience better rest and, um, uh, and recovery. So there's one other thing that I want to add is that switching off and taking off is two things. It is uh, resting, so doing nothing. Though it's also recreating. So doing something that brings fun, joy, and pleasure. And I think um, I'll share very personally, I used to have an, an idea that a weekend should have two R's. A Saturday is for recreating and a Sunday is for resting. So I need to plan to do something which is not work, though which is pleasurable and fun on a Saturday. And then I need to plan to do nothing um, on, on a Sunday, whatever the case is. And it's not quite this concrete um, uh, in, in, in many ways. So switching off may also require you to appreciate the distinctions between rest and recreating and to be able to do both. Zama, I'm very conscious of the fact that we are one minute over time um, and I don't want to impose on you. I also know that we promised everyone we'd be out of here by, by, by 10.30. So I don't know if anyone has anything more to say, any comments um, for Zama, any questions. I'd like to take this opportunity to ask everyone just in the comments, please, just to write uh, very quickly how they found today's session just some thoughts on today's session, because that is a beautiful roadmap for us in terms of how we carry it out to other provinces and to newsrooms as SANIF. Great, thank you. And I, mean, I also want to, to thank everybody um, for, for having been here this morning and, and I, I hope it was helpful and useful. And I'm, and I'm very happy to also receive any comments too, kind of in, in terms of feedback. Though really I hope it was helpful and I hope it wasn't too scary. In fact, as I said, the fact that we can have this conversation actually leaves you in a much better position 
not just to be able to to cope and deal um, and recognize uh, uh, should you should you identify with any of this though it was in itself uh, medicinal so it also helps you help others actually and it better equips you and I see this as a form of a, a, a professional development um, that has been organized for all of us. I completely agree. Um, do we have any other comments? One very quick last round. Maklatsi, Kate, from, from a SANF perspective, Hopewell. Well, thank you, Katie. I'm just gonna quickly jump in here, but I wanna say, Zamo, thank you so much. So helpful. Um, also, what I'm going to be doing is a roadshow with different media organizations in the beginning of 2021. I, I always do that. And, you know, this issue around wellness um, and, um, you know, dealing with the psychological trauma of our journalists. I just think you've, you've given me some really practical things to talk to media houses about. Um, and it's also just interesting because some of the, you know, some of the media organizations are really tiny. Um, and I think you've given some useful input on that. And then, of course, we've got really big ones. So, you know, a big, big thank you from, from me. And I might actually be picking your brains and, and just um, sending you a few questions before, before I go on that roadshow, if, if that's OK. But thank you. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, that's to you, Kate, and it's also to anybody else. I'm actually just dropping my, my email address um, there. Really, 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 I'm more than welcome. I'm more than happy for you to send me an email if you want to clarify something um, or from, from the presentation. And I will, I will respond. And um, as I said, I will also be sharing this, this presentation. Okay, thanks everybody. Have a stunning Saturday. Thank you for these wonderful comments as well. Um, we'll share this with um, on our SANEF website. And I'm also going to start speaking to more and more SANEF editors and council members about, about encouraging their teams to, um, yeah, to basically have more of these sessions, both as individuals in terms of the newsroom work and um, definitely something that we are going to be doing more of at SANEF. So thank you all for joining us. Zamo, as always, you were amazing. You've always given us your Saturday, at least when I've done work with you, and I can't thank you enough. Thank you, thank you, Katie, and um, thanks to everybody, and um, cheers and goodbye. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Jonathan, please stay on the line so we can just organize the recording. Thanks. Yeah, sure, I'm still here. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm also still here, Kate. Super, thanks, Katie. Enjoy it. Thanks so much for an absolutely wonderful session. Thanks for organizing, really appreciate. And also, Zudzi, thank you so much. Um, and Jonathan, thank you for all the tech support. Just, you know, wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Very so nice I just welcome. want to make sure we've got the, the recording. Um, so I know that when we, we leave the, um, this, we, we need to actually just make sure that we've got the recording. Can you assist us with that, with, with that uh, Jonathan, or, or do I need to do it? Um, no, I'll, I'll assist with that. Um, it's still busy recording, um, but as soon as we are in this... Um, it's it's cloud recording, so I'll just go and have a have a look on the portal and get the get the video, and then um, yeah, then I'll send it through. Will you send the recording through to us? Yeah, I'll do that. Fantastic, Jonathan. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Okay, super. Can I can I leave now or? Yes, um, yeah, I'll I'll end the I'll end it I'll end it now. Okay, bye bye. Thanks, thanks Jonathan. Bye. Cheers, bye. Thank you.